friends and welcome back to Cami's Corner and another installment of Harrowing Horror. This month we are taking a look at a classic and that is The Turn of the Screw by Henry James. This is a gothic fiction novel and it is a novella. It's important to point that out because a novella is intentionally written as such so that it is shorter than a traditional novel. Now the point of view, although it may seem as though it might have been written in first person and to today's modern writing standards it could be conceived that way james was very specific regarding the way this particular story was written before james's writing most fiction was written from the author's perspective so you were getting a descriptive of the significance to the person penning the story as well as any meanings that they may have wanted you to interpret however the significance of james's writing is contrived through a central intelligence modem and that is it's written through a character's eyes so that the reader feels the story or sees the story therefore they respond to it as an objective viewer almost like a participant in the story. So you can definitely get the vibe as to how the introduction of this story is written and how we kind of look at it from the perspective of narration. The play setting is London, Essex. The year it is 1898. That was 120 years ago, but it can be stated that this is written for the current present time of 1898. It is comprised of 144 pages broken down into 24 chapters and the unabridged version which I have here there is also a forward and an afterward and both are really significant to not only giving a little bit more backdrop to the story but as well as James as a writer. Price range on this can range anywhere from 50 cents that you can pick up in a used bookstore and the most expensive copy this time that I was able to find is a first edition printing of the two magics now the two magics was the first time that James actually put this story to printing originally the turn of the screw was published as a serialized novel in Collier's weekly at the time James was already a well-known author but hoping to increase the magazine's circulation as well as to improve its reputation Robert Collier spoke to James and based on a situation that James had currently got himself into he had just signed a long-term lease on a house and really could use the additional income so he agreed to Collier's proposal and he wrote this in 12 parts starting in January of 1898 and that ran through April of 1898 so the very first publication of it in fact was in 1898 but it was comprised with other works written by Henry James so of course depending on your version and publication date the ISBN number will vary the writing style is a descriptive narrative and although I have only seen what would be considered one movie adaptation. I'm just going to go ahead and focus on the movies up front because there are several movies that were created in reference to an adaptation of this book. Starting with The Innocents in 1961, then followed by The Nightcomers in 1971, and that one is starring Marlon Brando. The Turn of the Screw, as is the specific title of the book, came out in 1974. Followed then almost two decades later with Presence of Mind, and that came out in 1999. That was shortly then followed up by The Others. Now that one I have seen, and that one is, that one is starring Nicole Kidman. That one is loosely based off the turn of the screw, but it is taken from the perspective of the country of Spain. So it is a interpretation and that was directed by Tom Cruise. It was shortly after that movie came out that Nicole and Tom Cruise finalized their marriage in divorce. In 2006, in a Dark Place came out and then again in 2009 we have the same title of the book yet again, The Turn of the Screw. So again, the only one of those that I have seen is The Others and I, I remember it being very dark and it definitely gives off the vibes of this story now having read this story. But I also remember Nicole Kidman having given up on that project uh, towards the end of the film because she has to essentially then murder the children and I remember her saying that it was giving her nightmares and so forth so 
Um, again, although not specific to the story verbatim, it is very close in an adaptation. A turn of the screw is merely an action that makes a bad situation worse, especially one that forces someone to do something. James was very adamant right from the preface of this book to indicate that Peter Quint and Miss Jessel were not ghosts and that over time it was misunderstood or misinterpreted. During the time in which James penned this book, Belief in ghosts and spirituality was very prevalent in England as well as America. The spirituality craze started back in about 1848. There was an incident with two young sisters by the last name Fox who lived in New York. And the story became very famous because they were reporting they heard unexplained rappings in their bedroom, which is kind of just like a knock at the door. And it was believed to, of course, being conducted by that of a ghost. It was within that same year of 1848 that you started to see literature surface about ghosts and ghost sightings and it became a very popular craze. Of course everything has a reason and the rise in spirituality's popularity came within the 19th century as a delusionment to traditional religion and I think that it's continued that way because we see the creation of other such religions such as uh, Wiccanism and so forth that kind of offset the normalities of traditional religion. So let's take a look at some of the characters that are within our story and then we'll just kind of look at the setting overall of this story. Prominent figures of course are the governess Miss Gross who is the housekeeper. We also have Flora, she is an eight-year-old. We have Miles who is her older brother who is ten. We have Peter Quint, who is the deceased valet of the uncle of both Flora and Miles. And then we have also Miss Jessel, who is the previous governess and is also deceased. Now there are some other characters that aren't really maybe perceived as characters because of the way our story opens. We have our narrator and then we also have Douglas. So our novella begins as we see a group of friends sitting around a fireplace on Christmas Eve and they are telling ghost stories. Again, this is perceived to be modern day 1890s setting of England and a man named Griffith is telling a ghost story about a little boy. That is when Douglas intercepts and he proposes to tell more of a true story about a woman who is now deceased and who was once his younger sister's governess and he had a enamorment for her. Three days later, we see that a manuscript arrives in the mail and then Douglas begins to narrate the story. Douglas then goes on to explain that the woman had interviewed first for a governess job on Harley Street and she was quite smitten with him. Thus, he was able to convince her to accept the position of governess of his niece which is Flora, and his nephew at his country house in Bly. As stated, the previous governess, Miss Jessel, had passed away, and now Miles is at school, and the girl, Flora, is in the home and being taken care of by the housekeeper, Miss Gross. The one condition in which she accepts this position is that she cannot contact him at any time and must deal with all the problems herself, which kind of already leaves an openness for interpretation immediately off the bat that maybe perhaps he already knew of the ghosts of Quint and Miss Jessel and that he wanted to see how she was going to handle the situation. Perhaps in a way he was possibly the reasoning behind her madness. Now when she arrives at Bly, she is then initially met by Flora as well as Miss Gross, the housekeeper, and she receives a letter from the headmaster at Miles School indicating that his school is refusing to allow him to return back to the school after the summer holidays. So she's already got all of this to work with full well knowing that she has no ability to contact Douglas at any time. She's got to handle this all on her own. Once Miles arrives, the governess immediately starts to describe these children as beautiful and angelic, almost in a very creepy sense you get this very uncomfortable feeling that she's 
she's taken an extra liking to them to appease Douglas because she knows that if she makes him happy, being that she's smitten with him, then perhaps she can impress him, thus keeping her job and possibly looking to get her closer to him. She immediately starts these preconceived notions in her head that the children are good students and they can do no wrong, essentially. One evening, she's strolling around the grounds of what sounds like a very large man. She's having these thoughts of the children's uncle these thoughts of him smiling at her and you know having great approval of her position and what she's doing and so it's at that moment that she looks up in the tower and she sees a man at first she assumes it's the children's uncle only to find out later that the man disappears at first she's worried but then she just assumes maybe it's just a passing traveler and for whatever reason, he ended up in the tower. But then her immediate concentration and focal point goes back to the children. One rainy day, however, she goes into the dining room looking for her gloves and outside the window, she sees a man staring at her. She runs out of the house to confront him, but when she does so, he's already disappeared. She describes the man as having curly red hair, uh, red whiskers or scruff, if you will, and very distinguished eyes. She tells this to the housekeeper, Miss Gross, who immediately identifies that as that of Peter Quint, who is, of course, as stated, the uncle's former valet, and whom is deceased. The governess is very convinced that after learning of a relationship between Quint and Miles, which Miss Gross describes as too free, so there's some kind of maybe insinuation of an inappropriate relationship between the two as she goes on to indicate that they spent a great amount of time together and this provokes a sense of protection within the governess he's at that point convinced that the man isn't searching for her per se that he's somehow looking for miles in all of this this makes her wonder that if the reason he was expelled from school isn't perhaps something that he did intentionally due to this relationship with Quint. Then starts to have these preconceived notions that the children are intentionally communicating with ghosts behind her back and she's got to keep track of them at all times. So then she kind of becomes, instead of just a protector, she becomes obsessed with these children. You proceed to have these situations in which the governess is seeing these two apparitions one night she's sitting up late reading she hears something in the hallway only to see quint standing in the hallway yet again and then when she goes back into her room where flora the little girl also sleeps she finds that the little girl has risen from her bed and is standing behind a curtain looking out the window to which she says that she thought she saw someone outside however there was no one there. We have then yet another night where the governess sees a woman sitting at the bottom of the stairs with her head in her hands as though she has been crying. Several nights after that, she then wakes up again to find Flora behind the curtain looking out the window. Only this time to find that Miles is standing outside. A little creepy. So she's holding all of these sightings inside and she decides to finally let Miss Gross in on it and she tells her what happened. She needs to then indicate that she feels most certainly that the children are meeting with these ghosts intentionally in secret to spite her. She thinks that Miss Jessel as well as Quint are somehow trying to possess these children to come to the other side with them and lead them to their deaths. Miss Gross at that point starts to become a little worried and she then suggests that she's going to contact the children's uncle and the governess immediately takes offense to this and says that she'll leave if she in fact does that. So you kind of at that point start to see a breakdown in the governess because she mimics the situation that she encountered at the bottom of the stairs where she finds herself with her head in her hands and she's crying and then for whatever reason she kind of lets that pass and she decides to stay. At this point though you do see where there begins to be a disconnect between the governess and the children. It's almost as though the governess is trying to create this paranoia within the children perhaps to scare them away from the ghost but inevitably what it's doing is scaring them away from her. They don't trust her as much, they're quite fearful and frightened of them. 
So the next morning, after all of this ensues, Miss Gross tells her that Flora has developed a fever and she is absolutely terrified to see her. She feels as though she's being coerced into giving the governess information that she doesn't possess. The governess is continually hinting at, not directly asking, what are you seeing? What are you looking at? You know, trying to probe her for information. And all the while, Flora is a young child. She's eight. She, she hasn't seen anything. The only thing she has attested to is looking out the window and having seen her her older brother outside which yes is curious but there's nothing she has to admit to the governess so she becomes very frightened by her and wants nothing to do with her also another incident where miles has disappeared he's wandering the ground she finally gathers him at the end of the day and the two of them are sitting at the table and they're eating dinner and she sees quint yet again through the window. She kind of engages in a conversation asking Miles what is on his mind, what's going on in his head, and she really wants to know what happened at school. So as she's pressing him for all of this, there was a letter that was written that she had pinned with the intent to have it sent out through the mail to get to the uncle. She had left the letter on a table with the intent for Lou, who is one of the servants in the mansion, to pick it up and take it. Well, it was discovered that Miles had picked up the letter. He eventually, within this conversation, does admit that he did pick up the letter and eventually dispose of it, but she becomes very irate during this conversation with him. She really just wants all of these questions answered you know, what happened at school. He proceeds to admit that there was some rumors, if you will, um, that he started with friends, amongst friends, about friends, and that kind of got him into the situation that he's in. Um, she's still very adamant that she wants the children to admit to her that they're seeing these ghosts, that they're communicating with these ghosts. At that point, she still sees Quint in the window. She makes the observation. She informs Miles, and Miles then responds in a very subtle way. He asks the governess, it's he? And so she uses this as an opportunity to kind of get inside of his head, and she's like, he who? To which he admits, Peter Quint. He proceeds to call her a devil and ask where where is he at at this point she's trying to show miles where quint is standing out the window only to find that at this point the boy has grabbed her arm fainted and his heart has stopped beating i thought that was a really cool way to end the story so one child dies we can only assume that flora's fever given the time period is probably not going to get any better. What I loved about this story is that really leaves a ton of room for interpretation because you have to ask yourself, first and foremost, were these apparitions bad? Were they evil? Or were they merely trying to save the children from the new governess, knowing her intent was malicious and self-serving? Then it also leaves room for interpretation of how much the children really knew that they didn't say. I think oftentimes when it comes to horror, most people read it with the intent to get a good scare. And with classics, a lot of times you'll hear negative reviews when people read them in modern times because the scare factor wasn't there. The the story, as it's stated often, falls flat. There isn't enough there. But I think this story does everything for the psyche. And I think that's the beauty of classics because a lot is left to your own psyche. How did you interpret the story? And I think the genius behind a well-written story such as this is that it leaves you with multiple points of view and multiple interpretations where you yourself as the reader having been given that platform by Henry James to be a participant in the story is being able to ask yourself, did I read what I just thought I read? Because even at the end, I was looking at this because James said in the foreword that Quint and Miss Jessel were not in fact ghosts, that maybe the new governess was the ghost the entire time and she herself was trying to gather the souls of these children. 
So the beauty in the whore and what makes this whore is the ever-leaving presence that this story leaves upon you and lasts for however long you allot that story to live within you. You can actually reread a novella and focus on different characters. Obviously our narration predominantly is given by the governess, but maybe if your focal point then turns to the housekeeper, Miss Gross. Was she really even trustworthy to begin with? Was she, was the information that she provided to the governess in fact true or were these her own opinions that she formulated in her head? We can then look at it from the perspective of the children. There are so many avenues in which you can take this story. Now overall, I'm gonna rate this story three stars. I liked it. It wasn't spectacular, it wasn't so groundbreaking and memorable, but I think that it definitely is worth read because it's stories like this that you don't forget. That despite the fact that it may have not scared you, which the best kind of horror to me is not the horror that leaves you with spine tingling chills. It's the ones that leave you cold at your core because you're not really sure what your mind has just interpreted and leaving this type of story with the availability to go back and review it from multiple points of view perhaps this is one of those tales despite all of the criticism that it will receive over the tale of time again the story is 120 years old if you've got that much time to divulge and dig into a story you are going to find all kinds of interpretations there are so many different avenues you can take this and I think that the beauty of this is it really is irresolvable. There is absolutely no way to really confirm the thought process that our author had in regards to the final outcome of this because of the beauty in which he wrote so many different points of view. So again, I give this three stars. I think it's well worth the read. And perhaps it's good to just pick it up if you want to reread it from a different point of view. Let's pick a new selection, shall we? All right, here we go. Our new selection for next month is going to be, oh, The Totem by David Morrell. And I have a copy of that here. Again, The Totem by David Morrell. Until next time, friends, I'll see you real soon. Take care. Bye.